solve large intractable problems. It's a new venture altogether. Your brain is a wild horse there. Because remember, writing is not a team sport. You are not selling horse carriages when there are cars. I want to be known only as the trusted advisor. More like a tourist. Play to Potential Podcast. Marshall, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to host you at the Play to Potential podcast. Thank you. Very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and this podcast, we talk about three themes, Marshall, leadership, transitions, and careers. And maybe a good place to start is just uh, given your remarkably illustrious career over four plus decades in coaching and leadership development. Uh, maybe a good place to start is just, uh, you know, if you sort of took stock of this journey from a stepped away and just looked at it uh, from a distance. What are some of the themes in the way your journey has played out over the last four plus decades, Marshall? What would the chapters of the book be? Well, you know, I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. Uh, my dad had a small gasoline station. We we're brought up very poor. I, um, very fortunately, my mother was a teacher, so I knew how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide before I went to school. So I, I had a, a lot of education at home. Then I went to undergraduate school at a small engineering school, and I decided I didn't want to be in math. My undergraduate degree is in math and economics. Then I went back, got an MBA, which I paid absolutely no attention to at all. So I, if you give me a test, there's nothing there. Then I went back and got a PhD at UCLA in, in organizational behavior. That's when I actually sort of becoming interested in the topic. And then I was a college professor and dean and met a very famous man who changed my life, Dr. Paul Hersey. He invented something called situational leadership. And you used to work for McKinsey. Everyone in McKinsey has been trained in this. Uh, I trained people in this in McKinsey for years. And so I met him and he was a kind and generous man. And uh, he, I followed him around. And one day he became double booked and he said, can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll pay $1,000 for one day. And I was making at the time $15,000 for one year. I said, I'll try. And that was 43 years ago, $1,000 a day to a poor kid 43 years ago. That was a lot of money. And it turned out, luckily, I was very successful. I did a program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. And for some reason, they loved me. And they called him up and said, look, we were angry when Marshall came because he wasn't you. But send him again. He said, do you want to do this again? I said, I don't know. yeah, I'll do it again. And uh, that's how I got into leadership development. And then after that, I eventually developed something called customized 360 feedback. We did that for McKinsey for hundreds of people, developed that process. The head of training in McKinsey back in the day was a man named Harvey Gollop. He later went on to be the CEO of American Express. And uh, so I, we worked with Harvey Gollop back in McKinsey for years. And we had very big, he, Paul Hersey had big customers. So I didn't start at the bottom. And then uh, after that, I got into that, started our own business, eventually evolved and met Francis Hesselbein. Mm -hmm. And we did a book together called The Leader of the Future many years ago. It was On the cover was Peter Drucker, Francis Hesselbein, Richard Beckhardt, and me. And basically, who was I? Nobody. Yet, I did six books with him, and after a while, became one of them. And then after that, uh, after meeting Francis and Peter Drucker, I was on the Peter Drucker Foundation for 10 years. I was doing leadership development and coaching. I, I did coaching before there was anything called coaching. So I'm a pioneer in the area of coaching. And then uh, that gradually evolved over time. So I've been ranked number one coach forever and, and number one in leadership development in the world twice. And so after that, I uh, just gradually evolved. I met a great woman named Aisha Brussel, who's a designer. And she said, who are your heroes? Well, my heroes, back to my story, were these kind and generous people who are great teachers, Paul Hersey and Peter Drucker and Francis herself and Alan Mulally and all these iconic people, Warren Bennis. And she said, why don't you be like them? And I said, that's a nice idea. I decided to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And the only price is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. So I made a little selfie video and put it on LinkedIn. So I have 1.3 million followers on LinkedIn and I thought 100 people would apply. I'd adopt 15 young people. 
they would follow me around. I would tell stupid jokes. They'd laugh, make me feel good. And then they'd get old and do the same thing. You know, cycle of life. I was wrong. Eight, over 18,000 people applied. Wow. And over 280 have been adopted. And so now this program kind of changed my life. So a lot of what I do now, almost, most of what I do is just give back legacy kind of stuff. And, and, you know, so you've met some of these people. So what have you heard about our little program? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, number one, the, the quality of the people, it, it seems like exceptionally well curated most, you know, the, the best minds and the best, uh, and also it sort of seems like a diverse pool of people, some from the thinking world, some from the business world, some from the social impact world. So clearly, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating way of cascading, paying it forward. Right. So, yeah. so uh, tremendous respect for, for just the way the, the discipline with which you've sort of gone about the whole thing. So, thank you. well, you know, I'm, wor I'm working on a new project right now. One of the people in our group is named Nankande. Now Nankande is from Zambia. Mm -hmm. And she, I said, I give away all my material anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, last time I checked, we're all going to be equally dead. So we might as well do some good here. And so Nankandi said, I really want to help develop high potential leaders across Africa. I said, well, you can use my material any way you want, you know, whatever, translate it. She said, yeah, but then there's all this cultural stuff. And I came up with an idea. I said, look, put your name on it. Put your name on it and modify it any way you want to. She got all excited. Great. Well, now I have a new project called Knowledge Philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And the idea is I'm giving away everything to everybody, but put your name on it. Use it for young people. Use it for people I'm never going to talk to. Translate it. I don't care. I'm a Buddhist. And, you know, last time, the Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. And last time I checked, Buddha didn't have a copyright on any of his intellectual property. Uh, I think he gave it all away. So I'm trying to give everything away as much as I can. And it's been an amazing project. Uh, really excited. And I, I call it reverse franchising. Mm -hmm. You know, a franchise model is you have to use my material, but you have to use it as I tell you and mm -hmm. you pay me money. And then I sue you if you don't do what I say. You know, that's the franchise model. My model is I give you everything. You put your name on it if you want to. Use it any way you want for nonprofit business. I don't care. And if you want to pay for it, I've got a nonprofit. Just send me a check in any amount you want or none. It doesn't matter. Mm. It really doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. Um, a related question, Marshall. Uh, one of the things that comes up, you know, one of the people I spoke to was Linda Gratton, who's written the book, yes. Under Your Life. Um, sure. and, and given that we're going to be working, you know, into our 70s and 80s, and we're going to be living much longer, uh, one of the questions that leaders come up with or grapple with is how do I stay relevant? You know, uh, whether I'm 40 or 50 or 60, you've been relevant over four decades. Uh, if you had to sort of distill some wisdom around staying relevant, what are some of the things, maybe even you're a great role model in terms of staying relevant and, and the world has changed uh, in terms of, you know, what the world was in terms of the industries, the leadership paradigm to what it is now. So any, uh, any insights there, Marshall? Yeah, I, assuming I'm relevant right now, I've made it to my 70s at least. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> now, let me give you a way to look at life to answer that question. And how to stay relevant, I'm going to use you as an example. Because I like to talk to real people rather than abstractions. Are you ready? Yeah, please. Now, do you go by Deepak? Deepak, yeah. Deepak, okay. Take a deep breath. Take a deeper breath. Now, the good Buddhist principle is this. Every time I take a deep breath, it's a new me. It's a new me. And everything in your life was done by an infinite set of people. Their names were the previous Deepaks, the previous shoes. Close your eyes. I want you to think of all the previous Deepaks. Think of all the gifts they have given to you that's listening to me talk right now. 
Think about how hard those people tried. Think about all they did to help other people. Open your eyes. Now, if any group of people did that many nice things, what should you say to those nice people? Thank you. Do your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Now, did they make a little mistake or two over the years? Let go. Let go. Now, it, back to your question, moving forward. The Deepak I'm talking to, I'm writing a new book called The Earned Life. The Deepak I'm talking to right now, you haven't earned one thing. You have not, you've earned nothing. Almost everything you have has been inherited. It's a gift from the previous Deepaks. You didn't earn a thing, they did. The guy I'm talking to, you haven't earned anything. Now you have to ask yourself, what is this person going to earn? What is this person going to earn moving forward? And yesterday, I can tell you, I'm a Buddhist. I, I really had the ultimate example of the importance of Buddhism yesterday. I talked to one of the most famous people in the world, glamorous, good looking, r mega rich, famous. I said, on a one to 10 scale, how would you score the, this test on the average day? I did my best to be happy. You know, he said, four. It's not out there. It's in here. And you also need to think in another way of life. The previous Deepaks were like your parents. Almost everything you have today was created by those people. These were your parents. The future Deepaks are your children. What do you want to give to your children? What do you want to give to your children? And the most moving case study of this was my friend, Dr. Jim Kim. He's one of my 100 coaches, and he was president of the World Bank. He was head of Partners in Health, and in his life, he's probably saved literally tens of millions of lives. If anybody in the world could say, I can coast, it's him. I told him the story, you know what he said? I hope I can make mommy and daddy proud. I hope I can make mommy and daddy proud. Very touchy. Well, to me, every time you take a breath, it's a new you. You can't live in the past. The person I talked to, if you could be happy because of what you achieved, he'd be the happiest person in the world. The other thing is there are literally millions of people who would kill to be this person. For what? And for what? Yeah, millions of dollars and fame and so what? Yeah, so what? And you work in the area of transition. I worked with a lot of CEOs and you can't just play bad golf with old men at the country club and eat chicken sandwiches all day. Mm. You've got to earn, you've got to earn respect every day. And not only earn the respect of other people, you need to earn the respect of the person you see in the mirror. And when you stop doing that, you're living the past. And if you look at ex athletes in the U S football, basketball, terrible, depression, suicide, divorce, bankruptcy. They just collapse. Uh, Michael Phelps, the great Olympic champion, did a movie, I don't know if you saw it, called The Weight of Gold. I haven't actually. I heard about his uh, struggles with depression some time back, but I haven't seen the movie. Talked about ex-Olympians. Depression, suicide. Why? They, they thought, if I win the Olympic gold medal, that's it. No. You won the Olympic gold medal and billions of people cheered. What happens tomorrow? And if you're not careful, your, your entire identity becomes, a, my father used to say, used to be. Yeah, didn't you used to be Michael Phelps? Didn't you used to be an Olympic champion? 
your whole life is your used to be. So I think a great way to look at life is every day we're starting over here. And those people in the past may have done some great things. That wasn't you. Yeah, that pro football player that's sitting there drunk talking about what he did 40 years ago. That guy didn't win the Super Bowl. Some young kid won the Super Bowl. That guy's an old man talking about somebody that won the Super Bowl. Um, living in the past doesn't work. Just picking up on that, Marshall, um, clearly one is about living each moment, each new moment as a new you, but we also live in a world of abundance. And, and uh, 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 In my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Have mm -hmm. you seen that book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There? A very good book, yeah. One of the things in the book is when people say things to you, you never say yes, but. But what you just did. And all my clients that do that have to donate $20 to charity. Uh, I was saying, uh, uh, you know, in a world where there are abundant choices, I come across a lot of people who feel paralyzed. You know, they've achieved success in a certain domain, like you said. Uh, it could be a sports person or it could be a business CEO. But then you know that you have another 20, 30 years ahead. How do, yeah. you, uh, how do you make choices? And what's what's been your... Um, you know, observation around people who are thoughtful about these uh, transitions, when they transition effectively from one sort of innings, if you will, to another. Yeah, the people I work with, uh, for example, in a way, they have abundant choices. In a way, they have very few choices. Here's the problem. Yeah, could they get a job? Yes. They don't have to work anyway. The guy I talked to yesterday was worth tens of millions of dollars. They don't have to work. Could they get a job? Of course. You might say there's abundant choices. In terms of a job, there are not abundant choices. There are almost no choices. Why? You can get a job, but you can't get a great job. Yeah, you can get a job, but you can't get a great job. You can get some boring job, some job you don't want to do. There aren't that, to get a great job is not easy. And the people I work with, I say, look, you don't want to have a mediocre life. Yeah, there are million choices where you can have a mediocre life. There are not a million choices where you can have a great life. And what you really want to say is, how can I have a great life? And there aren't a million choices for that. And you've got to start over and pretend you're in sales. You're like a kid going out there in a the job market. Now you might say, well, I'm a big CEO. Yeah, you are. But guess what? Everyone else applying for that job has a big CEO just like you are. Yeah, and they're all big deals. And so you're just starting over. It's much healthier because when our egos get in the way, then we have the thing, well, I, I don't, you say things like, I don't need this. Well, nobody applying for this job needs it. Yeah, no, any job you want, all the applicants don't need it. So make, you know, you don't need it, big deal. Don't say that. It's not impressive. Yeah, you do need it. Hmm. Hmm. Got it. Uh, just moving to a, a, a different theme, Marshall, you've done a lot of thinking around uh, uh, value-based coaching or, uh, or pricing the coaching based on value, if I may call it that. And, and, in, and in my conversations, one of the questions that often comes up is how do I measure the ROI? Is it such a basic question? But it's oh, very uh, simple. I can answer that question. It, I don't. I don't measure it at all. My clients measure it. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you're the potential CEO. Now I'll describe you. Now either coach the CEO or the potential CEO. Mm -hmm. Now let's imagine you're the potential CEO of a huge company. First thing is I don't get paid if you don't get better. I get paid nothing during the entire coaching assignment. Nothing. Have you ever met anyone beside me who works for a year for nothing and get paid if they get better? Do you ever meet anybody else? No. No. You know why? They don't really believe in what they're doing. They don't have confidence. See, there's, there's one way to test if someone really believes what they're saying. You can ask a person one question and instantly determine their level of belief. You know what that question is? Do you want to bet on it? Mm. 
Do you want to bet on it? You know, if they say I believe it, but I wouldn't bet on it, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. Well, I bet on it every time. When you get paid for results, you learn humility. And the client I coached that I spent the least amount of time with improved the most. The client I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all. So I made a chart on one dimension, time spent with Coach Marshall Goldsmith, and the other dimension was called improvement. There seemed to be a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. I thought, well, this is kind of a humbling chart. I go talk to my client who I spent the least amount of time with and improved the most, Alan Mulally. Alan was CEO of the year in the United States. Um, unbelievable. Probably the best leader in the world in the last 20 years, at least corporate leader. So I said, Alan, of all the people I coached, you improved the most and spent the least amount of time with you. I showed Alan my chart. I said, Alan, the way this chart looks, you never met me. You'd really been good. So I said, Alan, what should I learn about coaching from you? He said, Marshall, you got one challenge, customer selection. You pick the right customer. You always win. You pick the wrong customer. You're never going to win. He said, don't make coaching about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about the great people you work with and how proud you are of them. And he said, the CEO Ford, my job wasn't that different. I don't design cars or build cars, sell cars. I get to have great people and... Every day I tell myself, leadership's not about me, it's about them. Well, back to your question. You're the future CEO. You will get confidential feedback from everyone around you. You will pick important areas to improve. You will follow up on a regular basis. You will apologize for your mistakes. You will involve me on a regular basis, and you will get measured twice. Now, Deepak, what if you said, I don't want to do that? You know what I'd say? Goodbye. I don't judge you. I don't care. You don't want to do it, don't. I'm just not going to work with you. Option A, you do what I say, or option B, I don't work with you. It's two choices. Well, you say yes. Then I go to your chairman and I say, you know, Mr. Chairman, this guy Deepak's get better. This stuff is judged by these people over this time frame. Is it worth this money? Yes or no? And by the way, if the answer is no, don't hire me. If the answer is yes, you can't lose. If he gets better, pay me. If he doesn't get better, it's all free. Well, I don't make the business case for my clients at all. They make the business case for me. And if they don't have a business case, I don't work with them. Mm. 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 Absolutely, Marshall. It's, it's uh, so, so refreshing to see uh, you backing yourself. I mean, I, I hear you. It's about backing yourself and having belief in what you say and sort of be willing to to sort of, uh, as I say, put, put money where your mouth is. Uh, Let me tell you what inspired that. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I was 14 years old back in Kentucky. We were very poor. And the roof started leaking. And, you know, we had to get a new roof or the house gets trashed. And to help save money, my dad had me work with the roofer to help him put on the roof. His name is Dennis Mudd. So it's hard to put on a roof, very hard work. And he was very serious and he tried to do such a good job. And, and we made the roof and it got all done. And Dennis Bud was very poor. And he looked at my dad, his name is Bill. And he said, Bill, I want you to inspect that roof. If this roof is of high quality, I want you to pay me. If it's not of high quality, it's all free. I looked at Dennis Bud. You know what I thought? This guy's poor, but he is not cheap. This man has character and dignity. I want to be Dennis Mudd when I grow up. I have never shown the character he has. Why? If I don't get paid, look, that picture, that's my view from my house. If I don't get paid, I'm not gonna starve to death. Dennis Mudd needed the money. He doesn't get paid. He doesn't eat. That's character. Wow. Wow. Back to the uh, client selection point you spoke about, Marshall. You spoke about talking to the CEO if he or she's uh, open to running with a process that you spoke about and the chairman. But are there other characteristics you look for in terms of coachability before you take on somebody? Three. Mm -hmm. One, they have to have the courage to look in the mirror. Two, they have to have the humility to admit they can improve because you see, I've, I found it, I'm very incapable of helping perfect people improve. If they're perfect, then they don't need me. 
And then four, they have to have the dis uh, three, they have to have the discipline to do the hard work. It's hard work. Mm. Nobody gets better because I'm a co their coach. Mm. Now, by the way, why do I always get ranked the best coach in the world? Nobody ever watched me coach anybody. Why do I get ranked best coach in the world? I have the best clients. And my clients say I'm wonderful. That's it. I've got great clients. And by the way, I can publicly talk about who they are. They write their names in my books. I've got the best clients. Nobody's got clients as good as me. Not even close. Well, I'm not a great coach because I'm a great coach. I'm a great coach because I have great clients. That's what Alan taught me. It's like a basketball coach. Imagine one basketball coach has the all-stars of all time. Another basketball coach has very mediocre players. The basketball coach that's coaching the greatest people of all time looks good. <laughs> always wins. <laughs> Wonder why. <laughs> right? I, I always win. Wonder why. <laughs> I get the best team. You spoke about picking the right team. You know, uh, and if you pick the right team, the odds are stacked in your favor. Uh, uh, someone like me who's starting this journey, uh, you know, often you don't have the opportunity to, to, to be eligible to work with the best team. You, and I need to work my way there. And as you look at your journey... Uh, Let me give you some advice. You want some free coaching? Pick a great nonprofit leader who has a spectacular board. And do it for free. Mm. Mm. You're doing good for the world and you're establishing a very upscale client base. I've done tons of free work. I was a coach of the President World Bank for free. I was a coach of the head of the Rockefeller Foundation for free, the head of the Mayo Clinic, the head of the St. Jude's Children's Hospital, the International Red Cross, the American Red Cross, the Girl Scouts. Do that. Sure. Thank you. Um, Marshall, the other, uh, the other piece I wanted to understand was uh, the boundaries of coaching. You know, uh, I read one of... Uh, you, you've authored thousands of articles across different journals. One of them, you talk about the harm that one could do by coaching if we don't realize where the boundaries end with therapy and with some of the other things which are around the adjacencies of coaching. Um, yes. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what are some of the boundaries uh, we need to be yeah. aware of? I think for me, the boundaries are largely my own self-limitations because see, I'm the world's authority at helping successful leaders achieve positive change in behavior. I'm not an expert on strategy or marketing or I'm not an expert on the business side of the business at all. The key is I don't pretend to be, you see, I don't really understand my clients' businesses at all. I can't be an expert on the international red cross and the girl scouts and Ford and Pfizer. I cannot be an expert on all these companies. I make no effort to do that, nor do not claim to do that. So I have a very limited knowledge base. And I do work that is in that knowledge base. Rita McGrath is the world's expert on strategy. She's one of our people. I'm not. Well, she does strategy. David Allen is one of my adoptees. He's a world's expert on getting organized. So where coaches get in trouble is they try to do everything to everyone. Now, what I tell coaching customers is this. The best way to hire a coach is don't tell the coach what you need. Ask the coach, what are you best at? And if what they're best at is not what you need, get another coach. Mm. Mm. Got it. Um, and on the line between coaching and therapy, Marshall, uh, maybe just picking that specific instance, uh, any, any guidance for people where they should tread the line carefully and not and, and possibly yeah, have... it's know, know what your background is and know what you do. I don't do therapy. I don't do therapy at all. Anyway, mm -hmm. my work is the opposite of therapy. Mm -hmm. Therapy is focused on the past. With my clients, I spend zero time focusing on why they have their issues. Zero. Mm -hmm. I just focus on helping get better in the future. Uh, my clients are mostly rich people who are over 50 years old. And, you know, I tell them, if you're over 50 and you're still blaming mommy and daddy, it's not impressive. 
get over it. You're above 50. Your parents are dead. You know, let's, let's let mommy and daddy go. Let's start taking a little responsibility here for your own life. So I'm very underwhelmed with people who whine about their parents after they're 40 or 50 years old. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, grow up. <laughs> I guess the past versus the future is a good distinction for us to bear in terms of uh, where we spend our time and attention. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and by the way, that's you know just do what you can do, just know what that is, and also know that most of the things in life you can't do, you're not qualified to do, and it's okay. I'm not a therapist. Do I don't claim to be? I'm not an expert on strategy. Don't claim to be. I'm not an expert on getting organized or giving speeches. It's okay. Here's my theory. If I wrote the book, I'm more than happy to express my opinion. If I read the book, ask the other guy that wrote the book. Hmm. Quite well taken, Marshall. Uh, you spoke about the NG100 program, uh, and you you worked with the best, you, you yourself have been at the top of the coaching profession for several years, several decades, and you've worked with the best of the best. Uh, for somebody like me who's embarking on this journey, uh, I'm curious about your take on what excellence looks like in the world of coaching. When you look at the stratosphere of um, people that stand out, including yourself, what does I'll it- I'll ask you answer this question. I, Deepak, am the world's expert at, what do you want to be the world's expert at? You tell me. I'm trying to stay focused on transitions and trying to let's understand. Use, and use, use, use a case study. Have you read the book Transitions? By Bridges, right? William Bridges. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. a good friend of mine. I knew him for years before he died. I met with him uh, every year. We had a meeting for 25 years. Uh -huh. So I know him very well. Read the book study all of his materials, study all the experts in the field. There aren't that many and really get to know them. Like a guy like Michael Watkins, who wrote the first 90 days. Well, it's not exactly about transitions, but it's kind of related. So get to know, I'm a, I am a good person to know. Get to know people who are what I call parallel experts. Mm -hmm. They're experts on topics that are related to what you're doing. And then you integrate their work into your own. Mm -hmm. I'm not Peter Drucker, but I learned a lot from Peter Drucker. I'm not Buddha, but I learned a lot from Buddha. You know, I'm not Alan Mulally, but I learned a lot from Alan Mulally. Mm -hmm. Well, you can learn a lot from me. Mm -hmm. Or Bill Bridges or any of these people. Right. And then you develop your own work. Now, okay, you take everything I teach. I'll give you a challenge. You take everything I teach. You modify it any way you want to. Use it in any writing or book that you want to. And I'll support you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, absolutely. I think uh, I've been I've been wondering about uh, how I could sort of develop my capability in transitions. Uh, it's 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 happening slowly. Uh, and I know it takes time. But I've been uh, and in, in the podcast series, I've had the opportunity to talk to Michael Watkins in the past and a lady called mm -hmm. Ibarra, who's also done uh, quite a bit of work on transitions. Good. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Now you had to write your, but you've got to write your own book. Mm, mm, mm. You have to have your own voice. Marshall, uh, one of the themes I want to talk about, uh, you know, as you speak about your uh, mission statement, you speak about wanting to help successful people achieve positive, lasting change in behavior for themselves. The yeah. people, themes. Um, I'm curious about uh, how we get behaviors to stick, changed behaviors to stick. Uh, what can we learn from your wisdom on ensuring that it's not a one-off, but, but follow up. You have to follow up over and over and over again. You have to get measured and basically do it the rest of your life. Mm. Yeah. By the way, Twyla Tharp, I'm glad you asked this question. I'm going to give you a technique now that takes three minutes a day, costs you nothing. It'll help you get better at almost anything and will stick if you do it. Now, some people are thinking three minutes a day, it costs nothing, help me get better at almost dead. It sounds ridiculous, too good to be true. Half the people start doing this quit in two weeks. We'll see how you do. Two weeks, people quit. It's called a daily question process. Mm -hmm. Okay, get together, a spreadsheet on one column, write down a series of questions, represent anything in your life you want to get better at. 
friends, family, health, work, whatever. Every question is answered with yes, no, or number. Seven boxes across, fill it out every day. At the end of the week, you get a report card. I'm going to warn your listeners in advance that report card at the end of the week may not be as beautiful as a corporate values plaque you see up on the wall. See, in my glowing introduction, you mentioned a lot of good things about me. One thing you left out, I have an incredible skill you left out. That's the ability to screw something up almost every day. Just screw something up almost every day. Well, you do this process every day, you get to look at it. Now, I have someone call me on the phone every day to make sure I do this, every day. Somebody asked me, well, why do you have someone call you on the phone? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. That's why if someone called me on the phone. My name is Marshall Goldsmith. I got ranked number one coach and leadership thinker in the world for years. I have someone call me on the phone every day just to listen to me read questions I wrote, provide answers I wrote every day. Why? My name is Marshall Goldsmith. I'm too cowardly and too undisciplined to do any of this stuff by myself. I need help. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay. We all need help. You do what I just told you. You'll get better at almost anything. Let me tell you something. You don't have the guts to do this. You're probably too cowardly and undisciplined as me. You know why we don't do this? It's hard to do. It's incredibly hard to do. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of humility. It takes discipline. It's humbling to look in the mirror every day. Yeah, it's humbling. It's not humbling to talk about values and change and transition and blah, blah, blah. talk, talk, talk. That's not humbling. What's humbling is when some guy asks you, what are you the world's expert at? And you don't, you can't even give him an answer. That's humbling. That's not talk. You see, there's a big gap between talk and live. Talk is easy. Live is hard. Almost all leadership development is talk. Buzzwords. As if somehow a better buzzword is going to help people change. Nobody gets better because of buzzwords. You actually have to work. And it's hard. Mm. If it were easy, I would not have someone call me on the phone every day. Now, there's a great book called A Checklist Manifesto, published by Dr. Atul Gawande from Harvard Medical School. If the nurse asks the doctor a series of questions before the surgery, the odds on unneeded infection plummet, and the death rate's cut by two-thirds. The majority of hospitals in the world do not allow the nurse to ask the doctor the questions. And what's the first question? Did you wash your hands? Why? Ego. Why won't the doctor have the nurse ask the question? Ego. They're ashamed. They are ashamed to admit, admit they need help. They're embarrassed to admit they need help. Yet, how do you get people to stick with it? It's hard. It's not easy. They have to work. They have to work over and over. And by the way, it's like getting in shape. You say, well, why don't they stay in shape after they get in shape? It's like, once I get in shape, I can quit now. I'll be in shape for eternity. That's not the way it happens. No, you have to keep doing it for life. Hmm. Hmm. And, and is there a point uh, where it moves from getting help from a coach to them sort of doing it themselves? Is that a, is that a year? Uh, well, Twyla Tharps, the world's greatest choreographer, has had the same personal trainer for 27 years. The trainer doesn't teach her anything new. Mm. Yeah. I've, had, I've had somebody call me on the phone every day for probably 30 years. Yeah, you know, you know, Deepak, maybe there is a time when I can get this all by myself and do it on my own. But you know what? I'm 71. haven't quite made it yet. Maybe in the future, though, I will. And I, 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 I won't need help in the future. But I'm 71. And you know what? I wouldn't bet on it. Thank yeah, you. right. Yeah, isn't there a time when Deepak won't need any help and he can do everything on his own? If so, you're a way better man than I am. Thank you, Marshall. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Marshall, a related question. Uh, by the way, D Deepak, I got a question. How many of the top 10 tennis players have a coach? All of them, I'm guessing. Why? Why can't they do it on their own? Hmm. Uh, they're number one in the world, you know, why can't you do it on your own? Why do you need a coach? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Pal Gasol is one of the people I've adopted. He's a basketball player. He has a personal trainer live at his house. 
Wow. So he works out every day while he's trying to get back in shape for the Olympics. Why? He knows the theory. You think he doesn't know the theory after all these years? He's 40 years old. He knows the theory. He's not going to do it by himself. I'm not going to do it by myself. You may be able to do it by yourself. <laughs> I'm not. I can't. I need help. I, I need help. And by the way, all those people I coach, hey, they need help. Before I did coaching, people were ashamed to have a coach. Today, I'm proud of my book triggers, 27 major CEOs. I'm CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. I'm number two CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. I'm the president of the World Bank. I need help. I'm the CEO of Pfizer. I need help. Yeah, I won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I need help. Who are we kidding? We all need help. Mm. Yeah, isn't there going to be a, isn't there going to be a time where you don't need help anymore? Maybe. I'd say I'm 71. Maybe when I'm 81, I'll figure it all out. <laughs> Point well taken, Marshall. Uh, one of the pieces I was curious about, Marshall, was the art of asking good questions. Uh, you speak about having some go-to questions which really provoke reflection with a coachee. Uh, in your experience, uh, uh, what wisdom would you have for for people or uh, coaches who are? I'll get, I mean, I'm going to give everybody my first six questions mm -hmm. that I challenge myself with every day. And if you just do nothing but ask these questions every day and fill out the form, you'll get better. I mean, I have thousands of people have done research. You'll get better. What question is? Did I do my best to set clear goals today? Now, I have a program I'm doing called the LPR 50. Mm -hmm. These are amazing people. I mean, let's see who's in our group. We've got the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee. We've got um, NBA All-Star, National Football League All-Star. Wouldn't you always join an Academy Award winner? We've got uh, uh, President Rockefeller Foundation. I mean, on and on, CEO of all these big companies and and we, we, do, we go through this every week. They evaluate themselves every day. And then once a week, we have a dialogue about this. And they, they meet in groups of, say, six to ten. Fifty people meeting in groups of six to ten. I spend seven hours every weekend on this. It's amazing. They love it, too. The first question is, did you do your best to set clear goals? Do you think they all going to get a ten? No. Nope. Some days I woke up. I did emails, I got on a phone call, the day was over. Next, did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my goals? Some days I got distracted, I forgot what I was doing. Did I, did I do my best to find meaning? I've had a guy who was a heart surgeon give himself a three out of 10 on finding meaning. It's not what you do. It's how it relates to your life. Now, the next one we're going to spend time on. Did I do my best to be happy? Yesterday, I did this with a guy who, for millions of people, would be a god. Rich, good-looking, young, famous, critically acclaimed, poor. Okay, Deepak, one to 10. 10 is high, one is low. What would be your score on the average day? Did I do my best to be happy? Did I do my best to be happy? One to 10. Give me a number. Six. So seven. Six. Yeah. We'll say 6.5. Yeah, the average in the world is 5.5. Yeah. I did this with three medical doctors Jim Kim, Ross Shaw. John Noseworthy, and they're in my book, Triggers, three of the smartest people I ever met. Yeah, World Bank, Mayo Clinic, Rockefeller Foundation. They're not dumb, right? All medical doctors. All three said it never dawned on me to try to be happy. So I said, well, did it dawn on you you're going to die? Did you kind of figure that out, death? They said, yeah, yeah. In medical school, they cover that topic, death. Yeah, yeah, death. Yeah, we're going to die, yeah. Well, I said, you think this is a silly question? No. I forgot to ask. I was too busy achieving things. I forgot to ask. I was too busy achieving things. How old are you? I'm 44. I'm 71. 
years. If you're 71 and you look back on your life and say on the average day, I got a 6.5 on trying to be happy. You know what you think about Deepak? Dumbass. Dumbass. You think the 71 year old you would think that was impressive or not too much. Now, in fact, we're all going to be equally dead here. My advice is be happy. And by the way, if you think you're going to be happy when you write the book, you achieve the status, you get that success. The guy I talked to yesterday, if there was a win, he was way beyond any win. The answer is not out there. The answer is in here. Mm. Now, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of something called the Bhagavad Gita. Of course. Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita, what is, what is, there's Arjuna and Krishna. What does Krishna say? Look, don't get fixated on the outcomes. Focus on the process, you do your best and you make peace. Uh, Deepak, have you ever gotten fixated on the outcomes? Often. Yeah. Reread that little poem. Yeah, there's a reason that poem is still around after all those years. It is what it is. Mm. You are where you are. You make peace, you come up with a strategy, you do your best. That's it. One of the happiest people I know is Harry Baxter, is the CEO of Baxter, uh, Harry, Harry Kramer, CEO of Baxter, and just a good guy. Have you ever met Harry? You should have him on your show, he's a great guy. Anyway, Harry, somebody said, how do you sleep at night? Because you have to fire people, you've had to lay people off. How do you sleep? He said, two questions. Did I do my best? Did I do what I thought was right? If I did what I thought was right and I did my best, I sleep at night. That's all you can do. That's all any of us can do. Mm. Thank you, Marshall. <laughs> uh, Marshall, the... Oh, wait, wait. I've, the last two questions are, did I do my best to be fully engaged? Right. And uh, did I do my best to build positive relationships? Now, Deepak, single or married? Married with two kids. Married? Oh, very good. And, and what's your wife's name? Kamini. Very nice. Now, do you believe customer satisfaction is important in life? Is customer satisfaction important? And should we ask our customers for input about how we can improve? And should we listen and try to get better? Okay. Have, you been asking your, have you been asking your lovely wife, what can Deepak do to be a better partner in this relationship? No. You know, Deepak, I'm very confused. Very confused. Now, who's more important, those customers that don't know your name and could care less if you died, or your wife who seems to love you on occasion? Uh, who's more important? Said your wife. Hmm. Why haven't you asked your wife how you can be a better husband? That's a question. Uh, Probably comes down to courage, not having the courage uh, to. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your right hand. My name is Deepak. My name is Deepak. I need help. I need help. I'm a coward. I'm a coward. <laughs> <laughs> uh. See, we're all cowards. <laughs> Why don't we do this stuff? Because it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing. It's humbling. It's painful. We mm -hmm. don't want to deal with the truth. It's hard. Why do I have somebody kick my ass? I'm a coward. Why does Pal Gasol have a trainer? I'm a coward. Twyla Tharp, I'm a coward. Hey, we all talk about willpower as if somehow we have all this willpower. Yeah. Willpower is grossly overrated. None of us have that much willpower. Who are we kidding? Hmm. Hmm. Marshall, uh, moving to a slightly different topic, I wanted to talk about longevity. Uh, you've been in this for four decades. I'm sort of embarking on this journey. It's been a few years. Uh, 
what are some of the things to bear in mind to run this like a marathon and not and not get burnt out? What have you seen with people who've sort of had a had a career over over decades in in the kind of work you do? You start over every day. You can never coast. Mm. Never coast. All that stuff in your past was a previous Deepak. Every day you start over. And when you think, well, I'm a big deal, I, that lasts for about six months. Mm. Then you're, you're used to be. Mm. Mm. Got it. Yeah, three, uh, three young guys came to my house. They were about 32, and they were all getting PhDs. And I lived at the time in a giant house in the suburbs. Of, I had published 35 books and lived in this mansion. And this kid's 32. He goes, well, we, we're going to be you when we graduate from college. I said, well, what do you mean? You'd be me. Well, we're going to coach the big CEOs, see, like you do when we graduate. Oh, I try to be polite here. I said, you're going to do what I do. Oh, at 32, you're just getting a PhD. You're going to be me. And I'm thinking, you know, when I was 32, I'd been a college dean and had about two or three years of big consulting experience. And you're going to be me. You better get started. And I'm thinking, you know, see this big mansion? Most people don't live here. And those 35 books, and you didn't fly 11 million frequent flyer miles. You're going to be me? Get to work. You put in your 11 million frequent flyer miles and you do the 35 books and, you know, you work with 150 CEOs, you're going to be me. Yeah, tell me what it's like then. Get to work. Well, Deepak, get to work. I hear you, Marshall. Yeah, there may be a shortcut. I am unaware of that shortcut. Yeah, nobody showed me the shortcut. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so Deepak, let's wrap up. Now, I'm going to finish with my best coaching advice, but before I do that, I'm going to ask you a question. Give me a couple things you learned in the last 90 minutes. One is about knowing that uh, it's a lot more, you need to work much harder on yourself than you expect the people you work with to work on themselves. The bar, you need to set the bar much higher for you, for you to be relevant. So I think that point is, uh, uh, that, that's, that's one thing that's sort of struck me. And second is, there's a big difference between you think you know something versus you really internalizing something. Um, so uh, it, it, was, it was great, it's, an it's a privilege to have someone like you spend the time with me and to point out these things right right when uh, as they happened so clearly yes. humbling experience and clearly a lot of work to do um, so so truly truly from the bottom of my heart marshall thank you for being generous with your time and you know deepak that's why i have someone call me every day you ask me when do we ever get to this point where we don't need this anymore we don't I don't. Every day I need help. I'm not, the only difference is I'm not kidding myself. I have no pretense. I know I need help. I know I screw up every day. Yeah. And a lot of what just happened, part of that was me helping Deepak. Part of it was just Marshall acting smart and showing how damn profound he was. You know, who knows? So we all can learn. We all can learn. So, you know, we all can look in the mirror and, you know, I'm no different than you. I'm no better than you. You know, we're just people. Yeah. Final advice. Take a breath. Take a deep breath. Imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. What advice would the wise 95 year old you who knows what mattered in life and what didn't and what was important, and what wasn't, what advice would that person have for the you that's uh, listening to me right now? So, all you listeners, whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of performance appraisal, that's all that matters. That old person says you did the right thing. You did the right thing. 
That old person said you made a mistake, you made a mistake, you don't have to impress anybody else. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who are dying got to ask this question, what advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words. Be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. Be happy now. Now, Deepak, you said you were 44, is that correct? Yeah, you can probably look at me and say, look at lucky old Marshall. He's got millions of dollars living in that big house, fancy view, all those books. Man, that guy's got it all. You see, Deepak, you got something I don't have. 24 years. What's that worth? No, no, 27 years. What's that worth? You want the best selling books? You want the nice view? Give me 27 years. We got a deal. <laughs> if you give me the 27 years. You can have the book. How about the money? Take it all. You got the whole thing. <laughs> so you, you don't want to look at other people and say, I want to be them. They may want to be you. So number one, be happy now. Don't wait till next week. Number two, friends and family. Uh, you know, you've been teaching everybody else how to ask for input and learn. You forgot to ask your wife how you could do better. Don't forget who matters in life. And number three, and you're doing a good job of this one. You got a dream, go for it. Because you don't go for when you're 44. You're not going to go for it when you're 84. And the business advice isn't much different. Number one, life is short. Have fun. You probably could lighten up a little bit there, Deepak. You're a little too serious, right? Uh, but the two of us, who's more serious, you or me? I think it'd be way you, right? So lighten up. You look good. Good smile there. That's good. Smile a little more. Yeah. And then number two is uh, do whatever you can do to help people. And the main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status. It's the 95-year-old you is going to be proud of you. And then finally, if you got a dream, you go for it. You go for it. Old people, we don't regret the risk we took and fail. We regret the risk we failed to take. So thank you so much. Marshall, a real honor and a privilege to be, to be speaking to you and to be coached by your live. I, I truly treat this as a, a blessing and a privilege. Thank you.